Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Christina Carter. Here. by telling you a story about a family that lived in Dunfield, Scotland. The year is 1835, and industry is changing in Scotland, and so a man named William is no longer able to support his family as a weaver. And so he makes the decision to move to the United States in the hope that he will be able to do better there, and that he will be able to provide for his family. They arrive in Pennsylvania, and his son goes to work in a cotton mill as a bobbin boy. And the job of a bobbin boy is to simply take the bobbins that are being used with the huge spools of thread and take them to the loading docks, and then they come back with new bobbins for the weavers. The boy didn't receive a formal education, but he did have a few things. He had a good work ethic, he was alert, he was self-motivated, and he was determined. Now this doesn't sound like the profile of the biggest steel tycoon of the 19th century, but it is. This was Andrew Carnegie, and his father William Carnegie moved his family to the United States in the hopes that they would have a better future. Well that future for Andrew did not start out with a good education, but it did start out with determination. His opportunities improved when he was given the job as a messenger boy for the Ohio Telegraph Company in their headquarters in Pittsburgh. And here he really displayed um, what, really deter what really turned into a good work ethic in the years following that. As a messenger boy, he quickly learned the names of the businesses and the locations all around Pittsburgh. And he also learned the names of the important men. And so doing this, he formed connections. The technology that the telegraph company used was really complex. And in a matter of weeks, he was able to learn how to translate that signal instead of using paper to do it in an audible way. So he was able to take the signal and then translate it instead of writing it down. So this messenger boy was promoted to a telegraph operator within the year. Andrew Carnegie really is the essence of a self-made man. His economic development, his intellectual development, his cultural development was really completely his own. It wasn't given to him by his family. He didn't have a formal education. In, 19, in 1853, he came on with the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. And this is really where his career started to take off, because he had mentorship in a man named Thomas A. Scott. The railroad business was the biggest business in America at the time, and so Pennsylvania Railroad Company was a great company to work for because it was also one of the largest railroad companies in the U.S. Again, Andrew Carnegie showed that he was alert and that he was focused, he was willing to learn. It was here that he learned skills of business management. He learned skills of um, investment, thanks to Scott. And he soon began <coughs> investing in oil. He also invested in sleeper cars. So at the age of 18, earning $4 an hour, he was hired on as a secretary and a telegrapher at Pennsylvania Railroad. A few years later, he became superintendent of the Pittsburgh division. And I think this is really demonstrates how hard of a worker he was and how motivated he was. Remember, he didn't have education, but he did have his own determination. The only education that he really received was somewhat through his family and then also through a man named Colonial James Anderson, who opened up his library on the weekends to boys to come and study. The man had about 400 volumes, and so every Saturday night, Andrew Carnegie would come into the library and spend hours and hours poring over books. And this wasn't novels like some of us would use to read on our spare time. No, it was books on management. It was books on technology. He wanted to be able to be the best that he could be. He also learned skills of cost control while he was there. And he also continued on in investment. And so by the age of 24, he was earning $1,500 a year. And to put this in context, this is $200,000 in today's salary today's money. 
But the impressive thing was that his investments were equal to that. So we're talking about a 24-year-old that's earning $400,000 a year with no education. But he was a hard worker. The Civil War came, and so in 1861, Carnegie was asked to come and bring revision to the telegraph company, to the telegraph industry, and to be able to make it better equipped to handle communication between the front lines <coughs> and the centers of the, in the cities. And so he really contributed to the Union success of the Civil War. At the Battle of Bull Run, he rode back with the soldiers, and he also helped with just making sure that the communication between the generals and the commanders was being well um, communicated and that the telegraph system was being effective. His attention to steel started in 1873 uh, and he sold all that he had earned through his investments in oil and sleeper cars and began putting it into steel. There are several key elements that really contributed to his success in the steel industry and these were hard work attention to detail, and the ability to get the right people on the boat, like we talked about in principal, or Principles of Management Organization and other books like that, other classes like that. Carnegie Steel was really um, a revolutionary company because it was the largest producer of steel in the U.S. Pig iron is kind of the uh, initial components of steel before it's transferred into um, the, iron, the steel that's able to make bridges. And they uh, processed over 200,000 ton tons of this pig iron a day. Railroads were also huge, as I mentioned before, in the United States. And so um, thanks to Carnegie Steel, the dangerous railroads that were built on bridges were able to be replaced with iron. And so this made them much more secure, and it also helped build Car the Carnegie Steel business. Carnegie Steel mu merged with U.S. Steel in 1901, and the business was sold to J.P. Morgan for $480 million. Today, that's $10.6 billion. Andrew Carnegie was the wealthiest man in the world. But what I really want to focus on for the rest of the time is talking about what wealth meant to Andrew Carnegie. And he believed that with great wealth came much responsibility. He believed that each man was given something from the Lord. And if he was given the ability and the talents, and if he had determination to, to gain wealth, his second responsibility was to use that wealth well. Some of you might be familiar with the, uh, the Gospel of Wealth. I know that we recently had to read it for American Political Thought and Practice. And it really struck me, because Andrew Carnegie does not believe in, in hoarding riches for yourself, or even just passing them on to your generations to allow them to do with them, to do with the wealth as they may. But instead, he believed in good stewardship of the wealth. This is why he really is a, um, a commander and a master of industry, because he believed that to use wealth well, you had to, to give it away. And not just give it away, but to give it away in a way that was effective. And so this is why he invested in libraries. There's over uh, 2,800 libraries that Andrew Carnegie built um, throughout his lifetime. And the total giving added up to being over uh, $350 million. So this is a huge percentage of his wealth that he gave away. And when he saw that he could not give it away after he died, or before he died, he created trust so that it would continue to go out and to flow into parts of the community where it would have true value. He knew that because of the mentorship that he received, he was really able to succeed in life. And so he wanted people to have the same opportunities. He didn't want to just give the money away. He considered that almsgiving, sympathetic giving. But he saw true stewardship of money to be in making sure that, that those resources went to constructive ends, that people knew how to use the money that he was giving out. And so that's why he focused so much on education. That's why he focused so much on building libraries. I want to close with a couple of quotes. Andrew Carnegie said, there is no class so pitifully wretched as one which possesses money and nothing else. Money can only be the useful drudge of something immeasurably more than itself. 
He believed that the problem of his age was administration of wealth so that the ties of brotherhood between the rich and the poor could be a harmonious relationship. So that the wealth of a few could go for the benefit of the many. And so we have a, what may come across as a cold steel cut tycoon who made his profit through cutting costs and on the backs of the people of America. But we see a philosophy behind that that is focused in stewardship and diligence to not only the acquiring of wealth, but the good use of that wealth. 